What type of person do you consider yourself to be? Would you say that you are outgoing and friendly, easy to know, confident? You're very comfortable in a crowd. People like you. You like being in a crowd. Or you can be just as happy being by yourself. But there's something about you that's sort of contagious. In other words, people like to be around you. Or would you say, no, I'm sort of self-contained. I don't need all that. And um, I just sort of like to keep my religion to myself and my faith to myself. And I just sort of like to do my own thing. I don't want really anybody getting per too personal with me. I'm not very comfortable with a group. Uh, I may stand on the outside, but that's okay. That's sort of who I am. And uh, I don't have to have a bunch of friends. I just, me, myself, and I, and you know, as long as I get along and I have what I need and I know that I've been saved back yonder somewhere, then uh, that's the way I am. That may be the way you are, but that's not the way God intended you to be. That's not who He created us to be. What kind of person does God intend for us to be? And is the Scripture, is the scripture specific about that? In other words, not just in some generality, but is the Scripture specific about the kind of person we should be? And it is. So I want you to turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians and the 5th chapter. And I'll give you a little background here. We're going to read those first 11 verses together. But Paul had just been talking about what happens when Jesus comes for all of us who are saints and who are alive. And about what's going to happen to our loved ones who passed on before us. When Christ comes, the Bible says they shall be resurrected first, and then we who are alive shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so, having settled that question for the Thessalonians, then he moved to this subject in the fifth chapter in verse 1. Now, as to the times and the epochs or seasons, brethren, you have no need of anything to be written to you. In other words, just trying to figure these things out, he said that's not necessary. But, he says, for you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly, like labor pains upon a woman with a child. They will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we live or wake or sleep, we will live together with Him. And having said all that as a warning, look how he concludes. Therefore, on the basis of all that, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you are also doing. So he's simply saying, you know, when Jesus comes, here's what's going to happen to our loved ones and to us. And those who remain, those who are lost, uh, here's what's going to happen. He says, and so in the basis of all of that, there's some things you and I need to deal with. We would agree that God is our great encourager. But also, it's very important that you and I become encouragers to others. And let me ask you this. How many of you can name someone that in, was an encourager to bring you to Christ when you were saved? Someone who was encouraging you. Look at all those hands. Yes. Someone encouraged you to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. So, the first point I simply want to make is this. We as believers cannot rightfully ignore our manifold responsibility to fellow believers. We can't ignore that. We have a responsibility. And it's interesting, when you read through the Scriptures, somebody says, well, I don't see where I have to be this, that, or the other. So, I'm going to give you 18, listen, 18 specifics from the Apostles of how you and I or to relate to one another. Because think about it. The Christian life is a life of relationship. Relationship to God, relationship to His Son, relationship to the Holy Spirit. All of that in order that you and I might be relational to each other. 
And in a world that's so mixed up and fouled up as we are, and so much distrust and unrest and all the rest, God's people need to just be living out who God intended for us to be. First of all, we are to accept one another. Secondly, we are to admonish one another. That is, sometimes we all need admonishing and correcting uh, in some way. Thirdly, we are to build up one another. Not tear each other down, but to build up one another. There are many ways to do that. Then he says we are to comfort one another. And uh, then, of course, we are to confess our sins one to another. That doesn't mean that's the only time you confess sin. doesn't mean you have to confess everything to everybody. But we must be open enough to say, you know what, I, I really made a mistake, or I really hurt you, I, I really should not have done that. We confess our weaknesses to one another. Then, of course, we're to encourage each other. Encourage each other, and we'll give that definition in a moment, but we're to, by encouraging each other, we are motivating them in an upward way. We are to be forgiving toward each other. And that means that no matter what happens, I forgive this person who says this, or that person who says that, or does this, or does that. We forgive each other. And Paul made that very clear in Ephesians when he said, Be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven all of us. Then we are to greet each other, the Bible says, with a holy kiss. Somebody says, Well, define that. Well, let's put it this way. A good handshake may be just as good. Uh, and today, when it comes to kissing people, that probably wouldn't... Uh, work the way it did in those days. So we are to greet each other. We're to be hospitable. That is, we're to be open and um, uh, invite people and uh, be inviting in our spirit as well as maybe invite them in your home or wherever it might be. And then we're to be kind one to another, tender-hearted, he says. And you know, but the Bible says a kind man, and I think that the same is true of a woman, a kind man or a, woman, a kind woman uh, is attractive. And if you'll think about people that you know are kind, aren't they attractive? And it doesn't mean they have to be, listen, it doesn't mean they have to be physically attracted. There are people who are not necessarily physically attractive, but whose kindness gets to you. They're kind. He says we're to live in peace with one another. We live in peace with one another. And we're to love one another. And I think a lot of people think they love and don't love. We're to love each other. If I love somebody, I'm looking out for what's best for them. I'm going to express that love in one way or the other. But we're to love one another. Accept them as they are. And then we're to be patient with one another. And all of us have had to be patient with others. And we've had people who had to be patient with us. You remember how many times did your parent say, how many times have I told you the same thing? And you know what? You do that to your children. Then we grow up and we become impatient. That's not right. So we're to be patient with each other because we all make mistakes in life and we will make them uh, through the days of our life. We're to pray for one another. Then, listen to this, we're to serve one another. And we don't pick and choose who we serve. We're, we're to serve one another. If, if there's a need, we want to meet that need. That's the way the New Testament church absolutely shattered the thinking of the Roman Empire when it was all authority and power and stomp on you and kill you if necessary. Christians served one another. We're to stimulate one another, which means we're to motivate each other, and we are to help folks, for example, do their best, motivating them to do their best, the best we, we can. We're to be subject to one another. That is, for example, on your job. You have authorities. You're to be subject to the authorities uh, on your job, and, and so likewise in the church. Then he says we're to be tenderhearted one toward another. So think about this. Here are 18 ways you and I to respond to each other. Why? Because in the Christian life, we are a family. And you just think, for example, in your family alone, you say you have two children or five or six or whatever it might be, and all of you practiced those 18, you'd think you died and gone to heaven. Amen? If everybody practiced those, or you probably even half of them. But we don't think that way. We think we get up in the morning and say, what am I going to do? Where am I going? What do I have? What do I need? What are they going to say about me? People live in a little, on a little island, me, myself, and I. That's not the way we to live. And if that's the way you live before long, you feel like a stranger because you shut people out. And oftentimes people want to get close to us. Watch this. 
not because they want something, but because they see something in you that they like, that's attractive, something that is godly. We're to relate to each other in a way that does what? We build up each other. We help each other. We love each other. It's, it's, when you think about how many times one another, one another, one another, one another, one another, one another. It's all about relationships. And if you'll think about it, we're living in a world that's, that's uh, getting further and further away from that. And proof of that is texting people. Everywhere you go. And I've watched this in restaurants here lately more than ever. Four people can be sitting at a table, got a meal in front of them, all four of them are texting. And I'll tell you something worse than that is seeing a husband and wife sitting across the table and both of them texting. I'm thinking, y'all don't have anything to talk about? There's, there's something wrong with that relationship. And I'm here to tell you, when you do not build relationships, you build yourself an island. And when the time comes and you get to hurting and you're wondering, where are my friends and where is this and where is the other? Because you created an island for yourself, which is certainly not of God. Now, if you look around and ask yourself the question, are you a relational kind of person or are you, I'm self-contained, I don't need you. There's no such thing as not needing anybody, not really. And God doesn't want us to live that kind of way. And so when you encourage somebody, you give them something. If I encourage you, I'm going to want to motivate you to either get something, achieve something, go somewhere, whatever it might be. You're building up the other person. So let's clarify the meaning of what we mean by encourage. And that's simply this. To encourage is to call to one side, to console, to strengthen, to put courage in, to inspire, to motivate with courage. So all of us need to see ourselves that way. And you think about this. Your children are growing up. You need to teach them that they are to be relational with people. Because when we relate to people, for example, we can all gain something from somebody. And we can all have something to give to other people. And the Christian church, the New Testament church, when there was a need, they all got together to help each other. And as a result, they absolutely transformed the Roman Empire. It was something about them that was different. And so when I think about... Uh, all of those passages of Scripture and uh, how God worked in their lives. And somebody says, well, Jesus didn't need any encouragement. Well, let's see if he did. Turn to Matthew chapter 26 for a moment. Matthew chapter 26. And uh, I want you to look at this passage in the 36th verse. Remember, this is God in the human flesh. He had all power to do all things. And now he's coming to Gethsemane. And the 36th verse says... Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, Peter, James, and John, and began to be grieved and distressed. Now watch this. This is Son of God, has all power. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and watch with me. Why do you think he said that? Because he needed their presence. And when I read that passage and think about if the Lord Jesus Christ uh, was in need and he was asking someone to encourage him, that's what, that's what they were to do. Come, come get you, you. Listen, they're over there, but I want you closer to me. There's something about knowing that you're here. Let me ask you a question. Do you have any friends that when you're going through a tough time, you want them to be close? Do you have any friends that, that you know, they don't have to say anything. You just want, you see, he didn't ask them to say anything. He just said, would you all come over here with me? He wanted those three to be close by when he was going through the agony of his life. What does that say? It tells me two things. Not only was Jesus God in the flesh, but he was man. The physical human side of him felt the very same things you and I felt. When we go through tough times, what do we want? We don't want just anybody by us. We want somebody who can encourage us. And all of us have been there. And I can think of people who have encouraged me in my life and going through very difficult times. 
uh, somebody who was always there, that I didn't have to call and play, say, would you please do so-and-so? One of my friends, I could call him on the phone, or he could call me when I was going through a tough, probably the toughest time in my life, and uh, he'd hear my voice and say, I'm coming, build a fire, I'm coming up and let's talk. I didn't have to say a word. He was a very stalwart part of getting me through the most difficult time of my life. He was just there. And uh, when, I, when I think about that, I think about, uh, I can remember the first person who's ever, who ever encouraged me. Now, I was six years old. That was 75 years ago. I know exactly where she was standing. I know exactly what color dress she had on. I knew she had dark hair. It must have been black or brown or something. And I walked out the door as a six-year-old in the first grade, and I heard her say three words that still ring in my mind, and I know the expression with which she said it. She said, I like Charles. It was my first grade teacher. She didn't like me because I made good grades, I can tell you that. <laughs> she said, I like Charles. Why would I remember that for 75 years? Because at that moment in my life, I didn't have a father. My mother was gone most of the time working. At that time, I didn't have anybody close by. And so here's this teacher who is this awesome authority. And I remember she was tall and overpowering to some degree. And uh, that didn't matter. I don't remember a thing else she ever said. <laughs> my grades probably prove that. I didn't. <laughs> but I remember that. I like Charles. Six years old. Never forgot it. The second person who encouraged me uh, was uh, my Sunday school teacher when I was an intermediate, or 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Uh, uh, he was my Sunday school teacher. And um, I moved from the church I was in, where he was my teacher, and uh, to another church. Uh, and um, so I didn't see him very often, except here's what he would do. He, I delivered a newspaper in this one long, straight main street. And so he left his work and drove up that street naturally to get home. He'd pull over to the side and park when he saw me, so he saw where I was coming. And he would just roll his window down and say, how you doing? And this one, you know, I'm thinking about you. And he'd talk about little stuff that really wasn't that important. And he'd always buy a newspaper. But he always paid me two and a half times what the paper cost. He didn't need to buy a paper. And I knew every time he bought one, he had one at home already waiting for him. But you know what he did? He said to me as a teenager, I was significant. I, I was important enough for him to catch me on that day delivering papers, and he'd pull up the side and wait till I got there. And all he wanted to do is to encourage me. Craig Stowe. He encouraged me. And you see, a lot of times we encourage people, and we don't realize how meaningful that is. I wonder if you ever take the time to encourage somebody. And you see, I couldn't do anything for Craig Stowe. I couldn't do anything for my teacher. They just encouraged me. They did something for me. They didn't realize. And my teacher would never have thought that just simply say, and see, she didn't say that to me. She said it to another teacher. I remember her name. Her name was Miss Croxton. And this was Miss Furl. She didn't even say it to me, except to that other teacher. And I overheard it. You know, sometimes you can horribly discourage people by what you say. And sometimes you can greatly encourage him. What does that say? Think about this. This woman said, I like Charles. Probably wondering if I'd ever get out of the first grade or the second grade. <laughs> Never did she realize that she'd have an impact on my life for 75 years to preach the gospel. She never, she never thought it, never crossed her mind. You don't know who you may be passing by who needs something that you might say. And so, Somebody says, well, um, I don't know that I'd say the right thing. Yes, you will. You know why I know you will? If you really care for them, God will say to you what to say. You'll encourage them. Sometimes all you have to need to say is, I've just been thinking about you, if you really have. 
And you know when somebody says that, you can tell whether they mean it or not. We're to be encouragers. And God knows how to make us encouragers. Now, um, I want to give you two biblical examples. How many of you know who Barnabas was? Well, poor Barnabas. He was not known by many of you. But let's put it this way. He was called the son of encouragement. And uh, that, that was the way they named him. And let me tell you what he did. And the reason for my telling you this is because I want you to remember this. You never know whose life you're going to impact and the awesome impact. Barnabas, when he heard, uh, when he heard that there were lots of people in need in the early New Testament church, uh, he brought a piece of property and laid the money at the feet of the apostles. Barnabas. First time you hear of him. And so the next thing you know, Barnabas is used by God to do an awesome thing. When Saul of Tarsus was persecuting the Christians and killing Christians and tearing them out of their homes and putting them in prison, then he got saved on Damascus Road. Well, the Christian church at that time would have nothing to do with him. They were scared of him. And when they said that this Saul of Tarsus had been converted, they didn't believe it. They had wanted nothing to do with him. Barnabas talked to the Apostle Paul, who was only Saul of Tarsus at that time, and began to get a hold of his heart and recognize that he was genuinely saved, that his Damascus Road experience was a true experience, and that he had now had changed and he was a friend of the church, he was a Christian. He was the one who stuck at his neck, but the Apostle Paul introduced him to the apostles and went to bat for him and said, this man is saved, he's called of God, let's accept him. Barnabas. And so I ask you, who was Barnabas? Oh, I don't know who Barnabas is. I'll tell you who he was. He was an encourager. That's why his nickname was Barnabas, son of encouragement. And what I want you to see is this. Barnabas, didn't, he didn't know all of that. Of course, he went with Paul on, the, on these missionary journeys and so forth. But he would never have imagined what would happen. And he would never have imagined that his willingness to take the courage and the motivation to help this man who was rejected by the church to be accepted, and then look what happened to the Apostle Paul. What was he? Well, most all of this we just talked about was his words, admonishing and forgiving and so forth. And so when I, when I look at, at Paul's life, um, he was an encourager. Remember when they stoned him to death and left him for dead in Lystra? He got up, next few verses, he's encouraging people. In Acts, when that whole account of the shipwreck takes place, here's what you find Paul doing. He's encouraging them to eat, encouraging them to, you know, stay on board because if anybody escaped, the Romans would kill over who's in charge. And so four times, what is he doing? He's encouraging, encouraging, encouraging. And when you read the epistles, that's who he was. You don't see him condemning. The only folks he condemned, the same folks Jesus condemned, that was Sadducees and Pharisees who were just hypocrites in a way. But he was an encourager. And so we ask the question, well, why all this emphasis about encouraging? Well, first of all, it's a major theme in the Scriptures. It's a major theme in the Scriptures. And we just read about 18 different ways we'd encourage. And then, of course, Jesus was an encourager. I think one of the most dramatic times was when he was walking along out of Jericho and this poor blind beggar. Now, a blind beggar was rotten poor and you just didn't even want to get around them and they're always scattered around the gates. And I love the King James Version when it says, Jesus was passing by and they were telling Bartimaeus to be quiet, shut up, because he was saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And uh, finally the Bible says, in the King James Version, and Jesus stood still. Not for some officer or some politician, but for a poor blind beggar who was on the bottom rung of society. Jesus stood still and he said to him when Bartimaeus came, Bartimaeus, what, what do you want me to do for you? He said, I want you to heal me, give me my sight. And that's exactly what Jesus did. Because you see, he was sensitive. He was an encourager. And what that did, it not only encouraged Bartimaeus, it encouraged everybody else. Jesus, the Son of God, taking time to heal a blind beggar. And then, 
You remember the woman who was caught in the very act of adultery, so it's not the question about that, and they got the stones all ready to stone her, a bunch of hypocrites, really they were. And uh, they were getting ready to stone her, and what did Jesus say? He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What an awesome response. We're to be encouragers. It's the gospel, it's the New Testament, it's the, it's the principles. And the truth is, all of us need encouragement to walk the faith. There's nobody here that doesn't need encouragement sometime or the other for some reason or the other. When you make a mistake, don't you want to be encouraged? You may blow it bad, you didn't mean to, but you don't want somebody to condemn you. You want somebody to at least understand why you did it. Maybe it's something going on in your life you don't even understand yourself. And then, of course, isolation from the encouragement of godly friends is very dangerous. The devil is always there to trap you, to trip you up any way he can. And it's the encouragement of godly friends who sometimes see things we don't see, and they warn us lest we find ourselves falling in Satan's trap. We, have to, we need to be encouragers. And sometimes you may have to say to somebody, I know uh, this is not my desire to get into your life, into your business, and so forth, but I'd just like to give you a word of encouragement. I don't know anybody who would reject genuine encouragement unless somebody is absolutely committed to living a life of disobedience. And what it means is this. If I encourage somebody, I want to build them up. I want to build them up in some way, in somehow. In other words, if there's an area of their life in which they're weak, I want to help build them up. And the truth is, what I do every Sunday in my heart, my heart's desire every Sunday, is to build you up by the Word of God, to build you up, to lift your spirit, to get you confident and bold and, and uh, brave uh, and emboldened about your testimony and your witness because of what Christ is doing in your life. I want you to understand the truth, which is the foundation of it all. I want you to have the courage to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to have the courage to speak out when you need to speak out. Be wise enough to be quiet till the right time to speak out. That, that's what I'm about. And all of us ought to be about the same thing to the degree to which God has given you the circle of friends or people you work with whose life your life can influence and impact. And it also means showing caring concern for people. If I really and truly want to encourage somebody, I need to show some kind of genuine caring. That is, I'm not going to do this for you because I want you to do this for me. That is not what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is that I see something in you that I can help in some way, some fashion. That's what I want to do. And then, of course, as we said, it's a positive motivator. It makes the difference, and I think this is true in any walk of life. What makes the difference in the lives of many people, whether they succeed or fail, is the encouragement of someone else. And I can remember the times my mom would encourage me when I didn't do very good, in some area of school. She never said, shame on you. You should have done better. She never, she said, no, I just want you to do your best. You, you, you just do your best and that'll be okay. She never condemned me for a poor grade. And um, I, I didn't always have poor grades, but I'm telling you back there when I did early, uh, she never condemned me. She just said, I just want you to do your best. What did that, what did that do? It, it, it made me want to do my best. My best wasn't nearly as good as my fellow students in lots of ways, but my mama said she wanted me to do my best, and if that's what she wanted, that's what I was going to do. It wasn't the best, but it was my best. And sometimes you don't need a sermon. You just need the opportunity to express it and the courage to express it to somebody who needs just a word from you. And we're living in a society when most people have major problems, difficult problems of all kinds. And if ever the church, the body of Christ, needed to be an encouraging body, this is the time we certainly need to be that. And think about this. Sometimes your encouragement could make the difference between somebody's eternal life and their eternal separation from God. And this is why it's a dangerous thing to be quiet 
when you should speak up. When you see somebody heading in the wrong direction, they may not like your encouragement. That's not the issue. You and I are responsible to be encouraging. Now, there are many ways to show encouragement. I'm going to give you 25. So that when you walk out of here today, you are totally inexcusable for not being an encourager. And the first one is this. You can call someone and encourage them with, on the phone. Now, let's give you one word. Or secondly, you can text them, if that's the best you can do. <laughs> and that's better than nothing. But, but you can text them. That's not my preference, but that's what you, one way you can do it. Then, of course, you can write a letter. You say a lot more in letters, more personal. And then, of course, there's a sincere compliment. Then, of course, you can say to somebody, what would you have me pray for you about? That's a whole lot better than saying, well, I'm praying for you. But what would you have me pray about? Or you can just let somebody know that you're praying for them. Then you can fulfill a need in someone's life. You know that there's maybe a financial need or some emotional need. And one of the ways you want to encourage them is let them know you're going to help them at that point. And then give somebody time. You want to encourage somebody, give them time. It's one thing to say, well, I hope you get along well and so forth, and never have any time to sit down. And sometimes a very brief conversation, 10 minutes, change somebody's whole direction in life. And then, of course, point them to some applicable scripture. And you listen, you ought to have a few scriptures on the tip of your tongue that you can hand out any time. And I'll tell you one of mine. It doesn't make any difference who I meet. If they bring up something, I can give them this. Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will guide you with my eye upon you. Everybody needs to hear that. I will guide you with my eye upon you. Psalm 32, verse 8. And so some applicable scripture is very, very encouraging. And then, of course, just tell them the truth. Sometimes somebody asks you something, just tell them the truth. And, you, and oftentimes you'll hear them say, well, thank you for being truthful about it with me. Because lots of times people want the truth. And listen, now watch this. Sometimes they won't like the truth. But he didn't say I'm to encourage those who like. I'm to be truthful and honest no matter what. Then you've got to be forgiving. If I really want to be an encourager, I've got to be forgiving. And then, of course, you've got to love them. There are different ways to love somebody. And one of the ways you love somebody is you can tell them. There's something about I love you that comes from a sincere heart that's powerful. And I say that to my friends. I say it to my, my staff member friends that I love. I say it to other people. I just love you. If I don't know somebody, I probably wouldn't say that. But if I say that, I say it for a reason. I've seen something in them that really moved me, stirred me, encouraged me in some way. And so, if you say to someone, I really love you. Now, for example, you have children, and there are children who grow up in this country and in the whole world who never hear that, I love you. Parents take for granted that their children understand that. Kids don't take it for granted. They either hear it or they don't hear it. I love you. Three words. That takes about a second to say that. I love you. I can say, I love you. I love you. I love you. You can say it in all different kind of tones. And it means what you say. And if I really want to encourage somebody, and sometimes people will be so sweet to me about different things, and, and my response is, I just love you. You know what? They've encouraged me in some way, and I have to express it. I could say, I thank you, but that doesn't send me. I do love them. I love their expression. I love their spirit. I love their attitude. I love their courage to say what they mean and what they feel. Then, of course, be a good example to them. You want to encourage somebody? Be a good example because, listen, everybody's looking for a good example of other people in some way. They want to see a good example, whether it's of a pastor or their boss, or another mother, or another father, or, or another young man or woman. Be a good example to them. Then likewise, give godly correction to them. In other words, if you love somebody and you really care, 
You want to give them godly correction. Sometimes people are in the process of making a mistake, and you may say to them, I, I just, I really care for what's going on in your life, and I'm, I'm thinking about you, uh, but I just want you to know that I've been praying for you, and if you keep heading in the direction you're going, you're going to make a terrible mistake. There are ways that you can say something to correct somebody's direction. You say it lovingly. And then, of course, if you want to, if you want to show encouragement, listen to them. And not many folks have listeners. Sometimes the only thing a person needs is to be able to speak and know that you heard them. Sometimes they don't want any correction. Sometimes they don't even want anything except they just want to be heard. And I think the one thing that really got my attention one day in this family that I happen to know about, and uh, this young lad told me, he said, you know, one of my problems is nobody listens to me in my family. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, I'll start talking and they interrupt me and next thing you know, I might as well just go away. Just to be listened to. Now you think about this for a moment. Suppose nobody listens to you. You may have something important to say or it may be something that's not important. But would you not agree that just to have somebody listen is awesomely encouraging? And as I said to you when my friend would call me and he'd just hear my voice and say, I'm coming over. And uh, he didn't come over to talk. He came over to listen to me express what I was feeling and knew that I needed an encouragement word at that time. And then, of course, you give them your full attention. And the best way to do that is look them square in the eye and say, happy to meet you, glad to see you, uh, thanks for coming, or whatever it might be. And so it makes a difference uh, when we do that. And then, of course, be patient with them. We have to be patient with people. They have to be patient with us. And be patient means I'm willing to wait till they say what they want to say although they have the courage to express what they're feeling. And then sometimes you may have to cry with them. If, if you're going to encourage them, you may have to cry with them. Not have to, but find yourself weeping with them because of what they're going through. And then agree with them when it's appropriate. Yes, you're exactly right. I think that's a fantastic idea. Agree with them. And all of us need some of that at times. Then give them a meaningful gift. Give them something meaningful. And I'll tell you, uh, someone gave me um, this week a very meaningful gift. Now, if I took the pieces apart, you wouldn't think that was meaningful at all. A piece of wood about like that and about like that. And so put a leather top on it and, and it was uh, tapped all the way around. And um, it's a kneeling bench. So I can just kneel down on that, this brown leather. It's absolutely beautiful, just the right size. It didn't cost a lot of money, but it was one of the most meaningful gifts I've ever been given. Somebody knew enough about me or heard me say enough about kneeling to pray. They took the time to find this old piece of wood, polished it a lot beautifully, wrote on the back, on the bottom of it, uh, obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. So I'm kneeling on that principle every day. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And uh, you know what? What does it say? It says, they were thinking about me. That person wouldn't have to say a word, but it was an absolutely very, very appropriate, meaningful gift. Then an affirming look. You've had people, you've had people do this. What, what about when they said, they affirmed what you were saying or what you were doing, and you can, you can look at people and see that. And then... Um, sometimes they just need you to pass on some helpful information. And my friends and I were uh, shopping the other day, and I saw this young lady, and she had one of these things on her hand, this controller hand. I, and and it said, uh, my hand had been hurting me for some time. And I said, uh, what's that for? She told me, and what had been going on, this, that, and it was hard for her to do her job. She had this brace on and so forth. I said, I can help you. Because I had the same kind of problem, and somebody has really helped me. And so if somebody took the time to, to share something with me, then I want to pass it on to somebody else. Very helpful information. And then to express loyalty to somebody. You know what? I really appreciate what you do. I just love that. Uh, you know, count on me. Uh, whatever, whatever. Just loyalty. 
And there are not many folks, I think, today who are really all that loyal. And then loving those whom they love and care for. For example, if you're my friend, I love you. I'm going to love the folks who love you. And I think about, I think about children. And I think about the society we live in and how many of them feel very little love. We, have, we, need to take, we, we need to take advantage of loving people who are related to people we love. Then I think assisting at somebody in an area in which they feel inadequate is a very helpful way to show encouragement. And I have some staff members that if, if they weren't right by my side at times, um, my work on a computer would be a total disaster. And because I don't understand some of that. Some of it I do, and I keep learning. But there are people I depend upon, and I think we, we, there's something healthy about good in, interdependence on each other, not just somebody who wants to do everything. If you love somebody, you want to be helpful. And then the last thing I would say, you want to be an encouragement? Say amen. Amen. It's all you have to do, and that's smile. That's the easiest way I know to be an encouragement. And so let me just say this to you. You encourage me. In fact, I can't wait to get here on Sundays because I can't wait to share with you what God has shared with me because I know it'll transform your life. And in the process of your listening, taking notes, that just motivates me for the next week. And so I go home on Sunday afternoon, start working on next Sunday because I'm motivated to give my best. You motivate me by your attention and by your writing and your and by your living and by your giving and all the rest. Well, if you think about your life, take your life out of the church and put it where you live, for example. There are people around you that if you encourage them, they're going to encourage you. And I would say to you, wherever you are and you're listening to this message, it doesn't make any difference who you are or where you are. You can be an encourager when Jesus Christ is in your heart. Because there's something that just bubbles up and flows out when He's there. You can encourage the people around you to trust Christ as their Savior. You can encourage your family. You can encourage people you work for. You can encourage your friends. You can encourage everybody. In one of those 25 ways, surely you can be an encourager. It begins with trusting Jesus as your personal Savior. That is, asking Him to forgive you of your sins based on what He did at the cross. He shed His blood. He died on the cross. He made it possible for you to be forgiven. What we do is ask and surrender. What He did is die and resurrect. And I would encourage you to do that. He will encourage you every day of your life if you let Him do it. And Father, how grateful we are that You are such an awesome God. And I pray that You'll sink this message deep in the heart of every one of us. And Lord, that we'll always be an encourager through the last day of our life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been blessed by today's program, please visit us at intouch.org.